Welcome to Uncover the Human, where every conversation revolves around enhancing all the connections in our lives. Whether that's with our families, co-workers, or even ourselves. When we can be our authentic selves, magic happens. This is Alex Cullimore. And this is Christina Migoni. Let's Let's dive dive in. in. Welcome back to this episode of Uncover the Human. Today, Christina and I are joined with our guest, Ashley Fulellan. Welcome to the podcast, Ashley. Hello. Thank you both so much for having me. Nice to have you. Yeah, welcome. We're excited. Uh, Give us a little background. So what's your story? What brought you here? Yeah. um, Okay, my story. I got the wrong degree. I think that that's maybe a good place to start. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I graduated from college with a degree in English literature, um, hoping to become a teacher. I did teach for a minute during the pandemic, um, which was a mess, as I'm sure you both already know. (laughs) Um, But the good thing about that is that it did put me closer to where I feel like I wanted to be in my career. Um, But after that, I decided to make a pivot. I worked in local government for a minute. Again, not quite the correct fit, but it got me closer to where I wanted to go. And that position allowed me to kind of stack up some money. That way I could move across the country to Chicago. I'm originally from Nevada. Um, And after coming to Chicago, I worked in ed tech sales at a startup. Startup culture is just rough. We talked about this during our (laughs) initial (laughs) meeting. Um, And I was in that position for about a year and decided that it wasn't for me, quit, and kind of went back to the drawing board um, and jumped into what kind of a lot of people give the advice not to follow your passion in your career, but my passion is in art. Um, So I decided I'm going to start a business using my arts background. So that's where I'm at now. I'm a new business owner um, and an artist. Uh, Through my business, I facilitate workshops with um, corporations as well as uh, local colleges and universities. And in these workshops, I help Teams and individuals develop creative confidence, leadership skills, and communication skills using arts-focused programming. So we're always creating something with the goal of developing these soft skills. Long story. Oh, yeah, that's <laughs> very <awesome>. fascinating. <laughs> yeah, we've definitely been in the uh, startup culture. We also found uh, yes. found that there maybe were some opportunities for improvement. Uh, when it's the leadership development space as well. Yeah. yeah, there really are. I was like I said, I was just listening to your last episode, I believe. Yes, it was your last episode. And you both were kind of defining what a leadership is in the Siamo verse. That was what it was. Yes. And yes. Christina, you brought up what a leadership, what a leader isn't. And I was really fascinated by like a leader not being driven by their ego because Mm -hmm. I think in sales culture and specifically in, in startup sales culture, like the Venn diagram in the middle of those two things is ego. It's just always ego. It's so, (laughs) and that was what I experienced. So using art, I'm trying to kind of like massage that culture out of workplaces. It's funny. I actually read an article I'm trying to remember from where. I, honestly, I think like some of the the big research groups like uh, Harvard Business Review, McKinsey, and some of these other ones either listen to our podcasts or somehow have bugs all over our house houses because uh, every time we say something out loud, then there's an article that actually comes up to, that says exactly the same thing, that proves the same thing. <laughs> And so the ego piece, I read an article this morning and I have to figure out where I read it from. We actually talked about how ego is the number one enemy of successful leadership. And I'm like, didn't we have this conversation last week? I'm pretty sure that's what we said in our podcast episode. But thanks for writing an article validating that. That's powerful. Y'all have power. (laughs) So unintentional. Yeah. Uh, So tell us a little more about how you're using art to kind of influence some of that culture and what you're hoping to see. Yeah. um, Well, A, the reason why I decided to 
go in the direction of using art in this space is because unfortunately creative thinking and artistic practices they they just don't really exist in corporate culture right now it's kind of like you see it in school maybe <laughs> maybe you see it in school <laughs> and then you go to college and if you're not majoring in art or in like an artistic you know study program then once you enter the workplace it's like you know it's gone so i want to bring that back for play a b i have seen within myself and i've seen in facilitating these workshops the way that art has the ability to kind of make people aware of blind spots that they're maybe not conscious to yet um so whether that be like lacking of skills or insecurities or inability to communicate an idea in a way that we're not used to art has a way of bringing that like right to the forefront um and i think my goal with this oh man there's so many goals <laughs> well the first this is like a big heavy one is when i was developing my curriculum I developed it using four foundations of creative thinking. Um, those are abstraction, collaboration, incubation, and reclamation. And as I was writing my curriculum, I came across the tenets of white supremacy culture. And my pillars work in conversation with, as a rejection of, a lot of the tenets that show up, um, like perfectionism, urgency, um, hierarchical decision making, just all of these pieces that are really, really prevalent in corporate workspaces. So through a DEI lens, I'm trying to use art to help create more equitable workplaces. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like I said, through just a fun lens, I want to see more play in workplaces, because I think if you can play, it opens your mind up in a different way than always looking for the right answer. Yeah. And so many things, to, especially to innovate anything takes being wrong a couple of times or, or being okay with like just forming an idea over time by virtue of making mistakes, which is yes. also not acceptable in the urgent perfectionist culture that is a lot of corporations. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And there's such a fear of around failure, but yeah, you have to fall in order to get to the finish mm -hmm. line. Yeah. <laughs> you should probably start changing the word from corporate to ego. <laughs> because well, <laughs> that's really what drives <laughs> most of uh, the toxic stuff that happens. Uh, yes. And then the, the companies that are actually almost uh, non-corporate or uh, far away from the traditional corporate are the ones that also are far away from the ego-centric uh, mm -hmm. ways of doing things. And they focus on collaboration and trying things out and creativity and innovation in, in a different way, not innovation as in like, go do this my way. <laughs> and then let me punish you when you don't do it that way. <laughs> that is how so many look at innovation and it yes. just is not that. Yeah. Go do this. My yeah. way is not what innovation means. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and don't ask any questions. <laughs> yeah. Figure it if out you do it, it your means own. you're not, you know, you didn't quite understand the directions. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but go create, uh, please create. <laughs> go be innovative, create, break things. I mean, not like important things that we would, yeah, don't do that. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't do break. That. Fail don't fast. Fail so fast don't people can't things. notice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Feel flash fast. <laughs> but don't bruise anybody, any, any egos. Oh, and no then way. come back to me in 10 minutes with exactly the right answer that exactly. I have in my head but that you don't know that I have in my yes. head. I need you to validate me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I really love that the uh, first pillar of your curriculum is abstraction, particularly. That's one that I think we've we've played with a lot. It's like, boy, how can we find the pieces that end up applying just to humans in the workplace? Is every everybody at the end of the day is human, so you get to play with these real abstract layers where it's how does that how do we work regardless of industry and regulations? Like those are all things you figure out over time. Those are all things you could Google. Those are all things you can figure out what how to how to upskill a very specific hard skill so to speak would be yeah. it's easy enough to go do that but the soft skills are the ones that actually like play in all realms and are necessary for anything that anybody's going to do that layer of abstraction is super interesting i'm curious how you landed on that one as a as a good pillar 
Thank you. Oh my gosh. I'm so glad that you like that one. That one has changed the most often. So <laughs> now that I've landed there, I feel really good about it. Um, like I said, it's changed. It started as innovation or yes, it started as innovation. Then it became um, improvisation. Mm -hmm. And then there was one other word somewhere in there, but then I landed on abstraction. And the reason why is because a, I did want anyone who was engaging with my curriculum to kind of immediately be able to identify that it was arts focused. Mm -hmm. And abstraction isn't usually a word that you hear in these other spaces. Like it's not like a corporate buzzword, like innovation is or whatever. <laughs> yeah. um, it's not create an abstract Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yes. A third quarter abstract. <laughs> yes. So I wanted something that like pulled people out of corporate speak, mm. that like foreign language. Um, and then I've very recently really gotten into abstract artwork and the beauty of representing something, I guess, in a non-representational fashion. Um, Rendering something is a better word in a non-representational fashion, looking at a painting and not immediately knowing that that's a flower. Um, and there's so many pieces to be able to create an abstract piece. Just like there's so many pieces within a corporate company, you mentioned that it's all human work. Every single human being is different. Every single human being is different. Everyone is their own abstract piece. And if we put together a bunch of abstract pieces, we're going to end up with a beautiful but abstract work. Um, so I really want to start by like hammering is such an aggressive word, but yeah, hammering that in. Let's <laughs> say shoving down their throats. Yeah, yeah shoving, shoving down their throats. <laughs> Suffocate them with. Suffocate, yeah, smother them with this concept. Smother them. <laughs> <laughs> that. Yeah, everybody's coming in from a different place and there's no there's no right answer. There's no perfect way to make all of these pieces fit together. But regardless of, of the way that they fit together, it's still going to be amazing and beautiful if you approach it from a appreciative place. Hmm. I hope that answered lens. your question. It's, yeah. <laughs> That's a wonderful a lens for one. to think about it. Just have this, this, this is going to be something abstract. It's going to be all these individuals. There's not mm -hmm. about a perfect fit. It's about them still just being able to operate together. It's a, it's a great image. I love that. Yeah. Thank mm -hmm. you. <laughs> Which, yeah, if you think of art, it's, it is that that's what it is. It's abstract in the sense that every, you know, you can follow the directions and it's still going to come out completely different. Yes, you can paint yes. by numbers and it's still going to come out completely different. It doesn't matter. Literally. Like it's the, the individual that brings it. The uniqueness of the individual gets translated into the art piece. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we, occasionally, we we like to approach uh, a lot of our leadership stuff. We start with like communication basics because it is about like, hey, like everybody's entirely different. They've got a different style. They're going to absorb information differently. So rather than that being overwhelming, how do we get back to those more abstract skills that are, hey, how do we how do we connect the dots between uh, people? If there is, everybody is coming at this entirely individually, how do we leave enough space and how do we understand other other people? And that's where we tend to jump in to try and start uh, just to get people to think about that. But I, I'm, I kind of like this layering in of just the, hey, let's let's take an even larger view of like, what are, what are we really intending to do here? Like, so I'll remember here, we are all individuals will be in and out. And how do we make this work as a whole? Yes. Yeah. And you brought up communication. Um, and I, I love talking about communication because at least since I've started this business, I've begun to really approach it in such a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and and my, my favorite workshop of mine, I'm going to tell you guys what it looks like, um, is my, one of my collaboration curriculums. And it does really, really focus on building up communication using like non-hierarchical decision-making practices. So what that looks like is um, each group gets a large canvas and their task in this is to create a large piece of artwork without speaking to each other. Ooh, so they like have that. to rely on, yeah, they have to rely on different ways of communicating and of getting an idea across without just relying on saying 
hey, we're going to paint a water bottle or we're going to paint a pineapple. And it's beautiful to watch in action because the whole point is cohesion. You want your piece to be cohesive Mm -hmm. and you want it to work with the ideas of the other people in your group, which is applicable to workplace goals as well. Um, in but theory. in the art making, yeah, in somebody theory, would, we hope, we hope it somebody is. would hope <laughs> under best yeah. intentions. <laughs> yeah, but it's great to see, like, if you're on one side of the canvas and you see your teammate add yellow to their side, and then you think, oh my gosh, it would be amazing if, like, whoever the viewer was of this piece saw yellow over there, and then it, I forced their eye to move up to my area, so I'm going to add yellow here too, or maybe I'll walk around the table and like splash yellow paint across the entire canvas like just watching people kind of come up with those different ideas is really amazing and i make them do it for a long time this workshop is usually an hour and a half and the art making process is an hour so the piece evolves you start with just like happy faces and then it becomes like splatters and then people like start thinking about different tools they start using their hands they make stamps it's amazing Mm -hmm. but yeah, going back to communication, just finding different ways of communicating, even in silence, is really powerful. That's awesome. I love that workshop. Mm-hmm. Thank I wanna, you. I want to be <laughs> in it. <laughs> <laughs> so where do you find, one of the things that we love about uh, running workshops and, and learning and development programs in general, even meetings, honestly, working with people, is uh, providing the space uh, for a new experience or a slightly different experience or some new information to kind of hit people uh, over the head if necessary, but <laughs> while they're getting smothered and something is getting shoved down their throat, yeah, shoved down their throat. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, but it's those moments of when you finally see it click with, uh, you know, individuals and then all of them. And then you know that something resonated to the point that now cannot be unlearned and so i do have a question (laughs) besides this (laughs) and it's it's you know how do you where do you find those moments when you're running these workshops where you're like and this is it this is where i'm supposed to be right now i've I've figured it out for myself or in like the for yourself i'm working with oh okay let me think oh my gosh I'm really glad you're asking me this question. <laughs> um, it wasn't the one I intentionally wanted to ask, but I got it. <laughs> That's okay. No, this is a great question. Um, I I shine in conversations. I shine working one on one with people. Um, but having a background as a teacher. I have been able to like find my shine in leading a group toward a goal. And my personal favorite part is when I can like bring them together in the reflection. All of my workshops are set up with a warm up, the actual activity, and then a reflection at the end. And a reflection is facilitating kind of one on one conversations in a group setting. So asking the question, hearing the answers, responding to that. And whenever I get to the reflection, I get to hear the way that people resonated with the work that they did. Oh, man, it's like savory. And those moments are when I'm like, (laughs) yes, I started this business and I'm in the right place. I might have gotten the wrong degree, but here I am like years and years later. And I like I everything brought me closer and now I'm here and it's wonderful. So I think that that's yeah, that's where I'm like maybe the most in tune with the work I'm doing. That's awesome. I love that. Okay. So now I'm going to ask the question that I actually wanted to ask. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) That was an amazing question though. (laughs) It does relate to what you just said. So when you hear those reflections and you have that moment of like, yeah, this is it. I, I got through, you know, like the, the, the shoving down the throat that whatever happened, like actually seems to be working. Uh, What do people, if there's like a top, three what do people usually share back as in that's their moment of I had a light bulb or I had a moment that I'm not gonna unlearn yeah um uh, top three okay it could be more than three just 
<laughs> what seems to be coming back. Often. Yeah, I'm thinking about like my favorite answers to some of the questions I've asked. Um, okay, one of my favorite things to do is in the reflection, I've often gotten like, why did you have us do this thing? Hmm. Oh, and I just love to like be a jester. I love to play and be like, well, why do you think I had you do this thing? <laughs> you answer your own question. <laughs> and the answers to why they think I had them do that thing are usually very different from my initial reason <laughs> in the first place. But they're, it's just great to hear. Like I said, abstraction, everybody's different and everybody's receiving things differently. So that's one. Another one was going back to the collaboration curriculum that I just told you all about. I was working with a group of students in a student leadership program. And again, I decided to act like a jester. And in the middle of them working on their large scale pieces, I made each group rotate to the piece next to them. So they were no longer <laughs> so working funny. on the piece that they started it. with. <laughs> they were now working on a new piece. And I don't, I didn't come into the workshop with that plan, but I was just kind of standing around and thought, why don't I try this and just see what comes of it? So again, at the end, I decided to ask them why they think I had them do that. And their answers were just so amazing. And these are students who like, you know, for the most part have never worked in a corporate workspace, but they were immediately tying it to what they assume that they'll um, come in contact with in their future careers. And one student even brought it like to a huge, like way overhead macro level. And he said that he viewed this as a practice in like advocacy and politicism. And he said that each generation makes, makes something. They make something out of, um, you know, policies. And then that generation passes on and the next generation, it's their job to come to those policies and make whatever changes need to be made or adjustments. But they don't always have the communication from the last generation to tell them what they were thinking when they put these policies in place. So he drew it to our activity because he was like, I was working on my piece. I was making all of these policies, me and my group were. And then we ended up going into a brand new space where they had already made their policies. And I couldn't ask them, do you want me to continue with this in your piece? Can I completely change it? Can I uproot and destroy? But they just had to figure it out in that way. So he was talking about like when we come in contact with these huge struggles and we don't have the opportunity to talk to the class that put those policies in place, like how can we approach it and make the adjustments to move it forward? I think that that was my favorite answer. I was like, wow, you are so smart. <laughs> <laughs> that is so applicable to so many things. <laughs> yeah. And it's true. You don't always get the opportunity no. to just ask, why did you do this? But you're often having to like make changes or adjustments yes. or whatever the case is. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm out of I've questions. Seen... It's so your turn, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> We've uh, seen that happen within even companies. People get shifted to a new you know, position, even within the same company. Now everything is different. They're inheriting some other team. They're inheriting some other process. They're inheriting whatever else. And like now you've got to do exactly that. Like you've got a team mm -hmm. that is used to what they were doing before, and now they're entirely shifted. And you're trying to get like on top of all of that without disrupting everything and trying to make it a positive positive change it's uh it's a lot to take on all at once it's a lot yeah <laughs> well that's really cool so how do you how how is this re um like received in some of the corporate spaces you've done this is, this is a, a really cool way of looking at it and very different from anything i've seen yeah i um let's see i've worked with two corporate teams for the most part i've seen my blessings working with students and then I've worked with two corporate teams and a teacher team. Um, corporate is a bit more of an uphill battle to start just because it's such like a, um, 
breaking off from what they know and what their general workday looks like. But thankfully, the teams I've worked with have been really um, adaptable and just kind of down for the challenge. Um, teachers, my the teacher team that I worked with was really interesting. I was thinking that teachers would actually maybe be the easiest because my background is in teaching. I know what it's like. And with this particular group, we were doing our um, incubation curriculum, which is all about like, cultivating productive rest and how you can find the right answer by kind of striving for zero striving to not find the right answer will get you to the right answer. Teachers don't have a lot of time to be productively resting. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Oh. So the reflection was a little bit tougher just because of, the barriers that just naturally exist in like the American school system and in how they have to allocate their time. Um, but even allowing for that space for two hours and watching them fall into flow state was really, really amazing. But it was kind of like once they, it was so quick to make that change from flow state into, okay, that was really cute and fun, but now I literally have to grade my students work. So yeah, that one was just, it was just really interesting to see like the difference in audience and how they received it. That's really cool. That definitely reflects kind of some of our experience, especially in corporate. We'll go in there and people are like, wait, what is this? What are we? Oh, hey, that's cool. <laughs> you give them a chance and then they're like, oh, hey, that, I like that. This is interesting. We could totally do this this way. Like, yeah, yeah. You just like give them the permission. Yeah. They just have to get over that first hurdle and then they love yes. it. Yeah, that is students also though, students just take anything. You give a student something <laughs> and they run with it. So knowing that students are going to eventually hop into corporate workspaces, yes. it gives me a lot of hope that yes. there will be more of like taking and running with it in the future. Yeah. It's like get get them when they're young and their yeah. minds are open. <laughs> yeah. Every yeah. new, new cohort pushes the needle a lot more than I think they think because they're all in the learning curve when they step into, you know, jobs and careers, whatever. They all have to learn mm -hmm. so much. They feel like they're at the receiving end. But there's a lot of push that they, they can give and provide and create a total shift based on what they're coming in with and their mm -hmm. expectations. And, you know, they, they'll meet resistance, but that's, uh, that's how we change. <laughs> yeah. OK, I'm I'm curious just to hear more on what you like think about that you said that every cohort pushes the needle more than they think have you like seen seen that happen in action can you just speak more to that because that's really interesting to me yeah well you see it like in the in the like uh meta scale of uh, all the all the uh articles that come out about like, oh my god gen z's in the workforce and here's what they want and millennials are asking for this so that's what they mm -hmm. want and you kind of see some of that start to change and there's some pushback but then individually when you get into these companies you just see uh different expectations and as we as we do think we do a lot of work with like middle management and so there's a lot of this feeling of like mm -hmm. oh yeah i will totally do this i want to help my team with this i'll help uh, them this way but i don't know how to you know move this up the ladder what are we going to do there and and the more that they let go of that a little bit and then just start to like, grow as a group of people who have the same uh, shared language, the more they suddenly start to push back. And then the senior leaders, uh, and not necessarily push back as in like, you know, fighting them. It's just they have a different style and culture. And then suddenly senior leadership turns around and is like, oh, well, wait, we got to catch up with this now. And then, and then that starts to push the other way, even though they feel like, oh, well, we can't make the decisions we get that we get them handed down to us when they actually start to band together and just act in a, in a certain way it just influences the whole system. And we, I think there's too much expectation that it is hierarchical when in reality, the, there's a total ebb and flow just of who's pushing out what, just whatever you're exuding as a culture is going to eventually help influence and dominate what, what's happening. So the more you grow that like middle cohort, you see that push both ways. Wow. That's so hopeful. <laughs> that gives me hope. <laughs> we hope. And it's amazing. It's hope. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you're right. Coming in at the middle is kind of like the best place because mm -hmm. the middle has access to both sides. Yes. And it it is, it, we, we don't want it to be hierarchical, but in a hierarchical mm -hmm. structure, hitting the middle kind of levels out the playing field between yeah. the top and the bottom yeah yeah especially if they oh. feel they can if they if they are moved enough to want to disseminate 
to the people that really look at them. Uh, the, the the one gift of the middle management is that whoever works for them or with them from the, I hate, you know, using the lower and upper levels, but from the lower levels, um, that's who they look at. They don't necessarily go all the way to the top. They look at my, their direct managers and that layer. And so mm-hmm. giving so that there's their influence, if they can harness the idea that their influence is actually pretty spectacularly powerful because they have all of all of the, you know, ground all of the people that are doing the actual work, but they also in especially in in certain places, they're also big enough as, as a unit that they can influence up. And mm. so yeah. it's it, it's a it's a good uh, it's a good space to be in if you can start shifting how you see it as opposed to seeing it as you're being squeezed by both sides. Like yes, you are being squeezed by both sides. <laughs> but you can also bend together and cause change on both ends. Yeah. Yeah. Middle managers are really important. <laughs> <laughs> I I think in my in my background I kind of grew a bit of a disdain for middle managers just because there was so much culture around the squeezing and like mm-hmm. not letting that disruption mm-hmm. to take place. But and again, going back to what you said in your last episode, um just like understanding how middle managers are specifically like people workers, Mm -hmm. like they really have to have an understanding of people and the shift in checking boxes. I completed all of my tasks Mm -hmm. to now I'm a middle manager. I'm working with people and I don't have to complete these tasks anymore, even though I was like rewarded for completing these tasks Mm -hmm. and that was incentivized. But then how, how could we better incentivize devoting all of your like time and energy and attention to growing your people? Like it's not a matter of checking boxes anymore, which is, I don't know. It's just interesting. Just the amount of shifting that that requires that I don't think a lot of managers get a ton of support on. They don't. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) They definitely don't. And yeah, and, and like you said, like it's a shift from tactical to abstract. Now you're in full abstract, all of it. Yeah. Your goals, your boxes, your check marks, your metrics, everything you're doing is abstract. But there isn't enough support to actually make help with that shift. Yeah. So you have to make like uh, actual tangible results happen with abstract moves, right? You have to be able to motivate a lot of people, get everybody on board with something. These are all the ways that you you deliver on what everybody else's discrete check boxes are. And they can go say, like, I've completed this task. You are now a vessel for <laughs> helping other people complete tasks. And that is a very abstract job. And the more you know, up the chain you get, quote unquote, uh, the more that becomes even more abstract. Now you're just helping people who are helping people who are helping people. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you're shifting okay. that canvas that you have and you're like, okay, you're like shift. And then yes, you're like, yeah. and you're like shift again. Yeah. And then, and then, then you're like, it's not even a canvas. Like, shift again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and in the end, you're not even working with the canvas. Now it's like clay. No. Now <laughs> it's just paint flying, <laughs> flying all over the place yeah. in the air. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's super fascinating. Uh, so what do you find? Where where do you want to go with all of this? Oh, another really great reflective question. These questions are so good because I feel like the end of the year has made me really just spiral into myself. So I'm happy that you're making me think about these things. Um, (laughs) Where do I want to go? I think... I definitely want to work more in corporate spaces Um, and just gain more of an understanding around the structure of corporate spaces and and what different ones look like and what different goals could look like. Um, I also see a future for myself around consulting, and I'm really not sure what that looks like or how that would look. 
pushing forward knowledge on such like an abstract concept, like using art in a corporate space, how could I shift that around a consulting lens? But I want to go there. So I'll figure it out. I'll read some books. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And if you ever want to talk about consulting, just let us know. Yes. Yes. (laughs) I plan to reach out to you. Um, We We can tell you where the landmines are. (laughs) <laughs> yes sounds good <laughs> i appreciate there are that. one or two <laughs> yes. yeah. and then i think otherwise i just want to keep on developing myself i mean i'm only i'm 27 and i'm glad that i was able to kind of get started developing my own business so early because i really don't have much of a fear of failure Cause I know if I fail, I have so much time. Life is so long <laughs> and I've really accepted that this last year. Like I have plenty of time to figure it out. So I think I'm excited to just figure it out. That's where I want to go. That's awesome. an excellent way of looking yes. at it. It is. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so one more thing that's really cool about what you, what you do is this, I, you, you mentioned it up front, like the idea of playing, you get this play in there. And I think people really discount that because uh, a, they, they miss out on what the actual opportunity is. The play gives this whole boost of creativity. There's a whole different way of thinking about things, but then there's the second layer, which is just fill your energy back up. And when you, you just fill your 40 hours with tedious tasks and you're supposed to continue to oh. endlessly like find new oh. energy to keep doing this. Like, no. I don't know. I, the, the, and I was, I've been there and I, and I was definitely um, believed that that was what you're supposed to do for a long time, that you're just supposed to just like, yeah, it's not even supposed to be enjoyable. It should just be work and you just don't devote as many hours as you possibly humanly can into it. And hopefully you get some rest uh, occasionally. And so you can keep coming back and hitting that. And the idea that we just keep <laughs> doing this. so appealing. I know, right? Like, ah, oh, it's so great. I, I miss it. <laughs> I mean, how can I, do that for, how can I do that for 40 to 50 years? <laughs> okay. People, why are people so bitter in retirement? That's weird. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, weird. Who would have thought? <laughs> <laughs> why, uh, why is everybody just a grumpy old man or a woman when they walk around? <laughs> yeah. Uh, curious kind of how you fell into some of that realization since there are some influences that may, might oppose that idea and what you'd like to see is like the future of, of work and play. Ooh. Um, well, I think, okay, going back to the... Um, uh, what is it called? Uh, d- dystopic, the dystopic um, picture that you just painted for us. <laughs> like, happy holidays, yes. everybody. Happy holidays, yeah. Life is miserable. <laughs> miserable. <laughs> um, the thing is, is that that's how workspaces are built. And that's how school is built. It's oh, It's yes. such a... It's like, how can we stretch your mind around this right answer? until you like break trying to figure it out and students are doing that all day you get 50 minutes in one class and then boom you're in the next class you have to shift from English to math now and there's no space except for maybe recess in elementary school and I guess electives in middle school anyways but there's very little space to like stop (laughs) just like chill out and I think that at the beginning of this venture I really moved away from play and I did not want to lean into play because there's no like tangible ROI on play and on playing. But I guess the further I've gotten in meeting people and hearing their perspectives and doing my own research, the ROI on play is that there's employee retention. Your, your people will want to stay because they, you're by encouraging a culture of play you're seeing a holistic person before you you're not just seeing a computer that can go for eight hours the second piece of this and me and my best friend talk about this all of the time she's also self-employed and both of us in our early self-employment journey were trying really really hard to work eight hour days 
But what that looks like when you don't have a manager kind of looking at you the entire time is micro dosing work for a period of eight hours. You're sitting down and working for 30 minutes and then you're on your phone for another 45 <laughs> and then you come back and do an hour and a half and then you, you know, go and make like an extravagant meal just to waste time. And micro dosing is so unproductive. So all of this long winded answer. I think I a want to see, Oh my gosh, this might be a crazy opinion, but I want to see a death to the eight hour work day. I don't oh, want yeah. to see it I, 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 I'll vote for that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you the rag. We don't need choke that. Somebody with just, it. <laughs> yes, I will shove that down someone's throat. We do not need eight hours. People are, can't be productive for eight straight hours. They're just not. Day. It's not a can't. They're not. Uh, no, is. they're not. It's already <laughs> not happening. Yeah. You can, you can yeah. ask people to sit for eight hours. Yes. <laughs> You're just making it more burnt out. (laughs) Yes. And yes, exactly. By the time we're 60, just a bunch of grumpy old, like, with hunches (laughs) in our back. I don't want that. And then in in getting rid of the eight-hour workday, I also want time devoted to the other parts around, like, being a human being, community engagement, um, time devoted to developing each person's goals and needs and aspirations. Um, and then the last part is just freedom to sit and look out the window for a little bit, like having that, um, I'm imagining what is, uh, I'm thinking about a certain philosopher. Is it, it starts with an H it's not Hegel. I can't remember, but having more of a, Homer, I don't know if he was no, a philosopher or more. He was, it was, uh, oh my gosh. Literature. Oh, it'll come to me right after we get off of the okay. podcast. I'm just thinking <laughs> about like the philosopher that really encouraged people to just lay around and not, mm. not, not focus on capitalism and on work just lay around be a person don't do anything and everything will work itself out i want to see a little bit more of that (laughs) sounds like the entire country of italy honestly (laughs) (laughs) and you know what they're happy and they're living to a hundred (laughs) so there's a lot of laying around and not doing yeah it'll be fine just think about it tomorrow yeah <laughs> and it will be fine, fine. <laughs> there's some quote that i will to- totally butcher and paraphrase here that's about like the, most of the issues of humanity can be traced back to man's inability to sit with his thoughts for 15 minutes like <laughs> it's just either with the inability like you can't can't yeah. sit still that long or i don't have the time and space to do it there's just it there's so much value in that and i was getting some uh, goosebumps and worried about the general future of the of what we're facing when you're talking about teachers not having any time for that kind of thing, for any kind of reflection, any kind of pause. I mean, that's such a crucial element of all of society is teachers being able to like help students and we we're not giving them the time and space to do that anywhere near effectively, much less budgets, much less every other thing that comes into play with the American education system. But man, it's uh, it's tragic to think there's also just not that time. There's no, it's there's no open tragic. space. Yes. And teachers are teaching the students. Teachers with no time are teaching the students with no time to enter into a workplace where no time exists <laughs> <laughs> to work it for the next 50 years. Like we need time. So that way you're prepared. <laughs> yeah. Oh. No, we don't need that. We need time. <laughs> and, the, and the only thing that prospers is Amazon because people just spend all their time not working and shopping on Amazon. <laughs> that's yeah, we're going to great for Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, great. Yeah, so, so, many, so much change. Sometimes we feel like, uh, I, at least I feel like we're with this tiny little micro doses of something of, of epiphanies and activities and experiences that hopefully won't be too easily unlearned and forgotten. I do sometimes feel that we're arming the people of France to storm against Versailles. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, come on. That's revolution. <laughs> For real. Let's do this. <laughs> Let's do this. <laughs> this one's not working. Let's take it down. <laughs> yeah. Time for a different again. system. Start it's again. always good to start again. Yes. 
Yes, get that blank canvas out. Mm. Yes, yeah. Come think outside of the box. Come up with yes. a new idea and just run with it. See how it works. And then if it doesn't, try again. Yeah, exactly. You know, start just with nothing and see what happens. Yeah. yeah. So last couple of questions for you. One is, what does authenticity mean to you? What a great question. You told me you were going to ask me that at the beginning of this. And I was like, I'm going to think about my answer this whole time. And then I didn't because <laughs> we had such a great <laughs> conversation <laughs> in other ways. Okay authenticity I think it means really really deep acceptance deep acceptance of yourself and of others and of all the space in between yourself and others deep acceptance just knowing that Everybody is operating differently. You are operating differently day to day and every single morning choosing to accept yourself for all that you are. I think that that's authenticity. I actually felt that's that great. in my heart. Yeah, that's wonderful. Oh, good. That's <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. And it's so easy to now distinguish when that's when we're not able or we're not allowing ourselves or others to live authentically is yeah. when that acceptance is not there. Yes. And even if, I mean, even if changes need to be made, like in all of these spaces, there's always going to be new ways of adapting and, you know, wiggling yourself to fit somewhere, but approaching that with acceptance, I feel like makes the whole process easier. It definitely does. Mm. And it's very hard. Acceptance is extremely hard. It is hard. <laughs> extremely valuable and extremely difficult. <laughs> yeah. That's always how it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, so when, where can people find you? Um, LinkedIn is a really great space. I'm Ashley Flewellen on LinkedIn, uh, business owner at Expressies Workshops. Um, through email is also the best place to reach me. My email is a fluellen, a f l u e l l e n, as in Nancy. Dot art at gmail dot com. Uh, that's where. <laughs> awesome. Perfect. And we'll have all this all this in the show notes. Perfect. Oh, I also have a beautiful website. Sorry, I just want to plug that. My website's yes. amazing. It's ashleyfluellen dot com. Yes, and Perfect. my artwork is up on my website too. So excellent. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Ashley. These are great thoughts. And thank you for sharing this. Let us know how we can help you. Really can't wait yes. to see what you do with this journey. This is very exciting. Yes. Thank you so much. And thank you all both for giving me this opportunity. I had the best time talking with you today. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we did too. Definitely. Let us know how yes. we can help you. And let's stay in touch. Sounds yes. good.